comes all the way down here. Walking along in a rad. She's doing better. Canaanite <coughs> City Water Reservoir. Oh, you can see the lake. Yes. So we're going to go down into the reservoir here. Get a picture from here. Let's take a better look here. Ooh. That's a ways down there. Uh, also, yes. <laughs> well okay, first deep. of all, look at the topography around you. We are next to a hill that could control a certain area. And yet this is the lowest part of the lower city of it. And this site, uh, and this is the vital water source for this otherwise very hot and arid environment. With very little rainfall, we are close to the Beersheba Valley, which is about 200 millimeters a year, which is considered to be the minimal amount for uh, agriculture. Uh, you really, uh, it's hard to trust it. The summers here are long and dry. And in this case, what they've done is a multifunctional water system. On one hand, it would drain the little rainfall when it was, when there was, to this uh, central lower spot. And at the same time, it would reach the uh, subterranean water level, which are relatively high throughout the negative. This is one thing that they knew. If you make a, a hole in the ground, deep enough, you will reach a subterranean water level. And that's therefore the meaning of the name Be'er Sheva itself. It means the well of something, of the oath of seven. Depends which version you read. But uh, already the book of Genesis records the uh, geological, topographical, climatical nature of this area and how it affected human behavior. And tonight, Be'er, what is the date of the walls that you're seeing there in the back? Let's go and see them from a closer view. Again, we have clear evidence of urban life here before the arrival of the Israelites. That apparently existed for a long period. You can even see relative uh, chronology in this area. This is one building that was later replaced by the other one built over its corner. These cement pillars are not original. They are placed to show you how that building is riding. It's placed on top of the older building over here. It's relative archaeology, relative chronology that, it, that is that trying to present here. RV is standing against on top of the walls and had watchtowers where the two signs are. One there and one there. 
Watchtower. What is that that doorway? We got a gate there. It's a little gate, right? Small a small gate. But a very hard small to get a cart through. This is not a war guard rooms or sick guard rooms gate. This is a little hole in the wall. It's called a bishbash. And it's a little The small gateway. It's a street that we're walking on here. A very small street. Dwelling house. One house, which is so typical uh, to all the dwellings here once we started. It, always, it almost always has the same characteristics of the bench along the side and the killer base in the middle. Looks like a pretty big house. This is not a synagogue, however. Not every bench along the wall makes the building. <laughs> Tower here, what's left of the tower? There's not much in here. I can't see out. It must have been a top level. Looks very flat. In the background is the Judean Mountains, hills. Therefore, of the king of Arad that stood against him, held against him so well that they had to make a U turn, go all the way down to Eilat, and eventually uh, follow more or less the road we took on the other side of the Dead Sea and enter the promised land from Jericho. This is the biblical narrative. Being so, are these the walls of the late bronze period that stood against? Uh, the Israelites and the answer is negative. No. no, this precedes the arrival of the Israelites by nearly a thousand years. Wow. This is people early bronze. This is in fact before even the middle bronze urban level. This is the first time that Canaanites settled in urban cities. We, we split the bronze periods into early bronze, middle bronze and late bronze. This is of the This is the city gate entrance. One of the oldest city gate entrances there is. We're going down the street into the city here. I guess it's wide enough for a person and a donkey to get through here. And the entrance to the palace here. What's left of it? And we're back on the street. Street between the palace and the sacred precinct. What's in here? Okay. 
standing pillar. What's the hole for? Libations. Libations. Offerings. Yeah. Well, there's an altar over here. Yes. And here's the altar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. And here's the altar. I guess that oh. upper area there. Yeah. yeah. So this is the altar see. area. It's, a, it's for libations. Libation offerings. Must use a lot. Oh, no. This. This would be. This is a basin. This. Remember the priest, Washing? the huge um, basin, uh, bronze basin? Mm -hmm. This would be for the priest to immerse. Oh. Purity. Before going to, to the uh, altar, which is where you would burn uh, your offering. person who works by himself, uh, native of this area, a bit like Guido Nadas, with very little budget, but he's the one to create those squares, <coughs> and this is where the material is stored, as he is trying to figure out the uh, water system of Arash. The people of the fortress here, and, and as we go inside, we will see the current the water uh, state of reservoir. the inner water reservoir, which is in the midst of... Uh, bring it inside the city here. There's a cistern. The cistern. And it goes into the city. This is the view from the top of Arad. And this is the big citadel. This is Iron Age, where the Israelites were here. The towers. And we're coming into the city gate here. Of the vulnerable entrance, the gate, and so you got two towers flanking the entrance which has inside four guardroom gates. You were only seeing two but there were two more inside. A little tower built up in the Roman period on top of it all uh, is blocking the fines from the very center. Okay? And an elevated platform. This is not the base of the wall. This is its original height. And in the center of it you got a big rock. Okay? And then if you follow it, where well now you have this metal support over the water reservoir, there was another room. And at the very inner room, facing the west, you've got a few steps leading to the uh, inner room. And against the wall, originally you had two erected stones, two slabs of stones, two stela, two matseva. In front of them, on the steps, originally it, there were two small altars, also made out of stone. They were found with traces of ash, and so was this. What is going on here? What is going on here? And this is apparently a, indeed a cultic center, a place of religious activity, which seems to, to match in so many dimensions the official Israelite religion that was practiced in Jerusalem. It is almost a symmetrical building, like the Solomonic Temple, with three dimensions, Ulam, Hechal, and Vir, or Holy of Holies. It's got in the outer courtyard, or the Ulam, a place for burning offerings. 
in the innermost part of it, is that the representation of the deity. You could argue for some sort of an unofficial, maybe illegal, uh, local activity related to uh, God. worship among the Judeans. Okay, that seems so shocking at first. You tend to think that God could only be worshipped up in the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Right? Wrong. It seems that there were other places of his worship. And you, if you thought that this may have been a domain or not Judai, wrong again. We did find ostracas. Okay? Cheap uh, material for writing on it, pottery shards, in Paleo Hebrew, giving instructions to the commander of the place of how to behave, certain orders, and we also found uh, chalices, bowls, on one of them it said Kodesh, holy, in Paleo Hebrew, and two pottery shards had names of names, names of priests we know from the Bible, Pashchur and Meremot. We know them from the Bible as priestly families. This was a Judaic religious center. And what was it following? Okay, what was inside? In Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments here. Two slabs of stone. Oy vey, what is going on here? What are these people doing? Okay, slabs of stones we know were created by the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob created standing stones to commemorate different events. And it was, and they were seen upon, uh, they were seen in a positive manner. <coughs> uh, Barr also wrote an article about this by a guy from Eilat. Later, when the Israelites are returning from slavery in Egypt, however, the attitude is totally the opposite. They represent the Canaanites. They should be defiled. They should chop down the, the, the erected stones, the standing stones, and the, the holy trees. They represent the Asherah and the Baal. You should go fight against it. Apparently, the priest here didn't read that section. <laughs> okay? There was a Judean veneration place of two standing stones. Who are they representing? The last bar, did you just get the last bar? Is Herschel Shank's review of a site called Kuntilat Ajrud, which has in it an amazing inscription in Paleo Hebrew. It's a trade center into the Sinai Peninsula, and it mentions there a blessing to God and Asherato, and his consort Asherah. William Deaver wrote uh, a book and articles about the consort of, of the God of the Israelites. Well, officially, the, the official text we are familiar with, it speaks only of one male deity. It seems that there was some variation to this. It seems that there were also domestic centers in addition to the official one up in Jerusalem. Tablets were found right here. Yeah. 